station. This is WDIV in Detroit. How do you hear me? WDIV in Detroit. This is International Space Station. Dan Burbank, I've got you loud and clear. Great. Thank you very much, Commander, for joining us this morning. Uh, the International Space Station is obviously a laboratory for research in a weightless environment. Tell me about some of the experiments that are going on during this mission. Well, some of the experiments actually, at least on the NASA side, involve trying to figure out how to keep humans safe and productive for a long period of time in space, long enough to go to the moon and stay there, long enough to go to Mars. And so some of the experiments we do look kind of holistically at um, changes in the heart, changes in the muscles, changes in the bones. And uh, we exercise an awful lot, and we've got uh, various different controls that we do. Uh, for, for different investigations, all of the astronauts that are training right now that are flying aboard the, uh, the U.S. segment of the International Space Station are century ultra, essentially ultrasound technicians. So we'll do ultrasound scans of our heart, ultrasound scans of blood vessels, muscles. Um, that's one example, and we can basically very quantitatively determine how what changes progress over the course of a long duration expedition aboard um, space station. And you just mentioned about the NASA side. There are other research experiments going on as well, are there not? We have a total of about 200 experiments going on while we're here during this one expedition. So there's an awful lot. I don't even know where I would start, but there's plenty of, of work going on in life sciences, the human research, like I just described, so one small piece of which, uh, physical sciences, we've got a combustion integrated rack in the U.S. laboratory that we're working on earlier today, um, or actually earlier this week. And the goal of that, at least the experiment we currently have loaded up right now, is to look at flammability um, issues for materials that we have aboard uh, the internet. National Space Station materials that we would use in future aircraft or spacecraft. So the, the idea is to figure out what the flammability boundary is for various fuels, various kinds, and exposed to various kind of atmospheres. And uh, there's a whole host of other things, uh, probably be too long to get into today, but it's quite a place and an awful lot going on, certainly plenty for the three people we currently have. That's why we're especially happy to get three more folks aboard tomorrow up there in that weightless environment for 38 days. How are you holding up physically? Not too bad for an old guy. I think uh, I think we're doing actually very well. We've got one new piece of equipment that's uh, that does a great job of um, basically replicating um, a gym that you might have on the ground that you could use with free weights, um, cardiovascular, all the rest of it, and uh, that will allow us to have loads for squats and uh, and deadlifts and things like that up to as high as 600 pounds. I haven't gotten near that yet, but uh, it's some capability that we have never had on board the a space station previous to this. And uh, a great treadmill, actually a couple of them, and uh, an exercise bicycle. All the equipment that we have that we use frequently is vibration isolated from the space station. The goal being to keep us healthy, but also not to interrupt all the sensitive experiments that we have going out throughout this entire 400-foot-long space station. As you've just mentioned, the key to enduring long-term exposure to a weightless environment is exercise. Can you tell me about your exercise routine in terms of how many hours a day or what's the requirement? Well, the standard for us is basically an hour and a half of weights a day and uh, one hour of cardiovascular. We can do more if we have the opportunity. Um, we often, uh, on occasion, will do a little bit less. That time does account some setup, and it does account for a little bit of cleanup afterwards. But it's a pretty aggressive schedule. In fact, I think we're seeing crews that are coming up to space right now that are returning back to Earth after a six-month mission with almost no loss and perhaps uh, some gain in muscle capability and uh, cardiovascular endurance. That's something we haven't seen. One thing that you and I have in common is that we both turned 50 this year. So 20 years ago, if I had asked you, could you have possibly envisioned at age 50 spending four months aboard a permanent orbiting space station? No way, Paul. I, 20 years ago was before I joined NASA. And, uh, and even after I joined NASA, I joined NASA thinking about flying on space shuttle for shorter duration missions. But having done two of those, I can tell you that it wasn't long enough for me. And uh, our mission's a little bit shorter than we planned. It's not quite six months, but it'll be four months. And it is absolutely spectacular. It is, I, I, I'm not going to want to come back 
to planet Earth afterwards. I will want to see my family. I'll want to do all the other things we can do. But the opportunity to float over to these windows and look at planet Earth going by beneath us, the opportunity to participate in this kind of research that we're doing on board is just the dream of a lifetime. Well, as a meteorologist, I can tell you that being able to float over to that window must be an amazing experience to look down and see the cloud patterns and see our beautiful planet. And you just mentioned the space shuttle. Now, as we move to the end of 2011, we look back on the ending of that shuttle program, but we also look ahead. So what do you envision as the future of human space exploration? Well, as we move from this point on, first off, I would just encourage people to understand that there's an awful lot going on on the International Space Station. The shuttle did what the shuttle was designed to do, what it was perfectly designed to do, and that was to build this nearly million pound space station low Earth orbit. So now we have this capability to do all the research that we need to answer the questions to be able to leave low Earth orbit and do the things that we really want to do as an agency and I think as a people. So in the near term, we've got an awful lot of work to do on space station, at least out to 2020 and beyond, but we're also basically turning over to commercial industry the piece of the puzzle of space flight that, that involves, at least for the United States, getting from low Earth or getting from the surface of the planet to low Earth orbit. And I think this the time is right to do that. And NASA is now taking up the mantle to leave low Earth orbit and go on to the moon, asteroids and on to Mars. And to do that, we need a giant rocket, and that's in work. To do that, we need a different kind of spacecraft. That's in development as well. And for folks that are listening right now, I'd really encourage them, for the young folks that want to get in this business, the time has never been better. And uh, I think NASA's got a tremendously bright future, and we need their brains, their energy, and we need them to come and fly in space and do the research on Space Station and beyond. Now, a personal question. You knew the moment you saw the schedule for this mission that you were going to be working over the holidays, and that's tough on anybody to be away from their family. Uh, I'm sure you're prepared for this, but is it a little tough to be away from home? I think that's probably the hardest part. The hardest part about training for a space flight, at least on International Space Station, and it's the hardest thing about, about being in space. But it's a little bit different and quite a lot better than it was in the past. And we can talk to our families every day, a couple times a day if, if, uh, if our time permits. And we can see them at least one time a week on a, you know, on a computer screen. So that goes a long way towards making us feel connected and close to them. And the families there have been there, you know, all along the way for me for an awful long time, leading up to this mission and throughout the mission. And uh, one of the tremendous rewards after the mission is done will be to get to return to them and spend some, some good quality time with them. During the holidays, during Thanksgiving, during, uh, during Christmas time and uh, New Year's, we'll be talking and seeing all of our families, you know, each of us, all the crew members aboard Space Station. And so it's not going to be like being a long ways away. And one last question. Uh, I see that you're from Massachusetts, so I'm going to assume that you're a Patriots fan. What do you think about a Lions-Patriots Super Bowl? I think that would be great. I, th I think that would be great. I think it would be great to have a, uh, a Patriots uh, Super Bowl winner, but, uh, but we'll see how that all plays out. And, uh, and uh, I'd just like to go back one, one quick thing, because I know you're a meteorologist, and I think you're probably also a little bit interested in astronomy. Most meteorologists, I think, are. Um, every time that we look out this window, or we look out the windows in the cupola, we're absolutely amazed. And, uh, and uh, the same thing goes for being on board a space shuttle. And I would say that two nights ago, I probably saw the most amazing thing I have ever seen in space, and that's saying an awful lot, because every day is filled with amazing things. And that was, we were flying over Tasmania, we had actually just seen the storms in the South Pacific over the Philippines, and uh, it was nighttime, thunderstorms lighting up the entire sky, and then, just before the sun came up, the Earth's limb was, you know, lit up as a sliver of uh, blue and, uh, and purple, and then there was this long green arc that extended probably 10 degrees or so from the horizon. Uh, um, actually, from the perspective of the cupola, which in which case we're upside down, up, up, you know, in my field of view, upwards. In fact, it disappeared behind the gem, at least 10 degrees, I think, 20 Earth or 20 moon diameters, if you think about it in those terms. And I had no idea what it was. It was a long green glowing arc, and uh, turns out it ended up being ended up being a comet that uh, somebody in Tasmania had seen about the same time, Comet Lovejoy, that had passed about 140,000 kilometers from the surface of the th sun. When it disappeared behind the sun, I think astronomers thought it would not appear again. It probably would burn up. 
but it's probably the most spectacular thing you can imagine. And from the vantage point of space, it's different than seeing it from planet Earth because there's no intervening atmosphere to see. So we took some uh, really neat pictures last night of it, about 100 or so, that we hope to make a movie out of. But uh, just wanted to toss that out in case you're interested. It's quite a place. Very, very interested. Well, we're out of time, Commander Burbank. I really appreciate your taking the time. Uh, there's a lot of support for NASA and its programs here in Detroit. The University of Michigan is a hotbed of researchers working directly with NASA, and you may recall the Apollo 15 crew was an entire U of M crew. So on behalf of all of us here in the Detroit area, we certainly wish you a successful remainder of the mission, uh, very, very safe travels home, and a very happy holiday to you. Paul, thank you so much. It was great having you aboard, and uh, all my best to you, to the team there at WDIV, and to, to all the folks in Detroit. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year to you. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event.